Hi, I'm Reverend Cindy Layton, and I'm the pastor at Smithville First United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship today. As part of this video, you will hear the choir's special song for the morning, and you will hear me as I give the sermon. I hope that it blesses your heart. God bless you.
I'll never forget one night when my husband and I, we were bopping along 183. <laughs> from Austin to our home, just on the other side of Master, up from here. And all of a sudden, you know, all the cars were just like, er, and we're there on the highway, all backed up because there was a detour. They were doing some work, as they seem to constantly be doing, on 183. And so they had to detour us off of the highway into a neighborhood. Well, we'd never been in that neighborhood. And this was a long time ago. I'm not even sure. Did we have GPS back then? I don't think we did. Our car didn't have it. The phones didn't have it back then. We're just like, okay. You know, where's the North Star? I mean, you know, we were kind of trying to figure out. Because once we got off the highway and into that neighborhood, all the little arrows that are supposed to tell you where you're supposed to go to get back eventually to the highway were mysteriously missing. None of those arrows were out there. And we're driving around in the middle of the night in this neighborhood. And you know, one lost car was just following the other lost car. All around, all around this large neighborhood. And eventually, Ian has a good enough, if it had been up to me, I'd still be in the neighborhood. You know? But Ian has a good enough sense of direction that he knew the highway was, you know, that way. And so we just kept, we keep going, you know, and going so we could get back eventually to the highway. And quite a few minutes later, we were thanking the Lord that we did see the place where we could get back on the highway and continue on our journey. In our lives, we encounter detours. And Jesus, in our reading for today, encounters those people that would like him to take a detour around the way that he knows he must go. So if you were listening, the Pharisees come to him and they say, Jesus, you should not go to Jerusalem. Hmm. Jesus had had encounters with these Pharisees now for three years. And never that I remember in Scripture is there a case where when they speak to him, they're saying something to him that is for his well-being. Right? Most of the time, when they ask him a question or they present a, a situation, it's because they're trying to catch him breaking the law in some way so that then they have a case against him. But all of a sudden, there they are. And by this time, it is really close. You know, we're during, we're in Lent, right? And it's getting closer and closer to that time when Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, these Pharisees are like, Jesus, um, you seem to be wanting to go to Jerusalem. And we really think that you should not go there. You know, Jesus had this amazing way of being able to read people. Jesus immediately probably had that experience that I have occasionally when somebody's just trying to pull the wool over my eyes and all the hair on the back of your neck stands up. Has that ever happened to you? Because you're just going, you know, danger, danger, you know. That probably happened to Jesus that day because he's thinking, why all of a sudden? Do you care about me? And the truth of the matter is they probably didn't care one bit. They hated Jesus. They were afraid of Jesus because of all the power that he had. And they knew that Herod had kind of like equal feelings about Jesus. And they didn't want Jesus to go to Jerusalem because that would give Herod a chance to take care of him. Have you ever thought about that? Herod would get the opportunity to get Jesus out of the picture, and these Pharisees, they wanted to do it. And so they act as if they care about Jesus and say, you know, you really don't want to go there. 
His hair is there. And they want him to detour around, to get off the path. And so Jesus knows it. And Jesus says, you know, this is what I need to do. Nothing is going to keep me from going to Jerusalem. Nothing. Well, he knows. Jesus knows that he needs to go to Jerusalem because that is where God has told him to go. That was his purpose. Or that is his purpose from the time he was born to this point in his ministry where he knows that in just a few days he will be where he is supposed to be. Jesus knows that Jerusalem is where he will give up his life for the salvation of the world. He knows that. And he also knows that Jerusalem is known for killing God's prophets. I mean, if you think about it, only a year or two earlier, they had killed John. So Jesus knows, and historically, Jerusalem was that place. He knows he has to go there. And he knows that in Jerusalem, they will now kill the Messiah, the very Son of God. But he knows that that is the path and the purpose that has been placed before him. And he cannot deviate from his path. He cannot. Now, even the disciples at one point said, No, no, Lord. You do not want to go to Jerusalem. And his message to them was exactly the same. You cannot stop me from doing what I have to do. Many of them, many of us have been called by God to do a specific task. Many have been faithful and have followed the way they have been shown and have stuck to that path before them, right? Many of us have done that. But some of us have taken these detours around what we know the Lord is calling us to do. And I'm one of those. Now, I've shared part of this story with you before, but way, way, way back, <laughs> well, long time ago, I was 18 years old, getting ready to graduate from high school. And in those days, they had these huge youth rallies. And they would bring all the kids together. And this was in the Dallas area. And they'd bring all the teenagers together. And we'd have this time of singing and, you know, and everything. And preaching and everything. And then they would end it with an altar call. They figured if they had that many of us together, they better take up advantage of that opportunity. Right? But on this particular night... The altar call was very specific. It wasn't, you know, do you need Jesus as your Savior? It was, have you ever felt a call to the ministry? Some sort of ministry in the church. And if you have, would you please come to the front? I'm sitting there and very clearly I hear, that's you. You need to get up. And I'm looking around, there's 250 teenagers in there, nobody's moving. And then all of a sudden, I found myself standing up and, you know, making my way to the aisle. And then as I looked over this mass of young people, I saw my brother who was sitting as far away from me as he could get, and he stood up. And then I looked over on the other side, and a young woman named Neva Cancano stood up. And those of us who are clergy in here know who she is. Lo, these many years later, she is the bishop of one of the conferences in Arizona of the United Methodist Church. So the three of us stood up, and we made our way down to the front while all the other ones are going, oh, you know, I know her, right? You know, whoa. And there, you know, and we went down to the front. I was 18 years old. I don't know what my brother said to anybody when we got home, 
But I went and I was so excited about this. This was something cool and new for me. And I went in and I went straight to my mom, which is interesting. Because usually I, my dad was the one I would speak to. But for some reason I went straight to my mom and I said, Mom, you're never going to believe. I really felt the call of Jesus tonight to be a, a minister, a pastor in the United Methodist Church. And she looked right at me and she said, you really don't want to do that. <laughs> well, her history was that she had grown up a Methodist before it was united, and then she had been a United Methodist pastor for years, and she knew, right, how difficult it can be to be the pastor of a church. And then she also knew that women in ministry was a brand new thing. It had just barely started in 1975. Just barely. And she was already hearing stories <laughs> about what was happening to these dear women that were feeling the call. And so she, she said, you don't want to do that. And unfortunately, the one time in my life that I paid attention to my mom was right then. And I, you know, graduated from high school, had a summer of working, and then went off to college, and that was all in my brain. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. And so I majored in, you know, music education and became a teacher and all of that. And it wasn't until I was 40, almost 40 years old, I think I was 39 or something. I was right there. And you've heard this part of it, where a dear pastor that I was working for in a church, because I had since quit teaching school and was working in the church, thinking, maybe that'll be enough. Because for all of those years of teaching school, though I was a good teacher, in the back of my mind, it was always like, no, there's something else you're supposed to be doing. There's something else you're supposed to be doing. And so... That one day, he just confronted me and said, have you ever felt a call to the ministry? And I just looked at him like, oh, yeah. A long, and that's what I said, a long, long time ago. And he just looked me in the eyes and said, so what's holding you back? And at that point in time, he had had a great job. The kids were in high school. They were doing their independent kind of thing. And, and I was working in the church, and I just had to look at him and say, nothing. Nothing. And within, oh, six months of that conversation, I was in seminary starting the process at the age of 40. Now, people would ask me all the time, once I got out of teaching and started this whole process for and was in the ministry. Do you miss teaching school? And I would just go, no. <laughs> no, though I was a good teacher. And they'll say, they would say, well, did you like it? Well, I'd say, you yeah, know, most of the time. Most of the time. It was great. Most of the time. And that was always my answer. Most of the time. But since I started into the pastoral ministry and doing what the Lord had called me to do so, so long ago, when people say, do you like what you do? I say, I love what I do. I love what I do. And there's no caveat. You know, there's no most of the time or when things are going great. It's just, I love what I do. In the good and the bad. And believe me, I've been in situations that aren't so good. Right? And then I've been in amazing churches that are, you know, amazing, phenomenal. In all of it, when you're doing what the Lord calls you to do, whatever that may be, your response will be, I love it. I love it. And so, we, when God calls us to a task, when God calls us to a task, whatever it is, whether it's your vocation or something else, God will be with us as we follow God's way and as we do what God has called us to do. That's the promises that we get in Scripture. We are not alone in all of this. And so it can be a call to some kind of, some sort of ministry in the church or it, as a lay person or as a licensed minister. It, you know, it could be that kind of call. And believe me, 
<laughs> it's never too late. But for others, it is a clear call to some other vocation. I mean, look at you. You're all sitting here, right? To some other vocation, to some other job that really is what you are called to do. It can be a call to be the best mom or a dad if you still have little kids in your home and, well, well even if you don't. Because you never stop being a mom or a dad, right? It can be a call to do that to the best of your ability. And it can be possibly if you're young, and we have a few young ones here, your call at this point in your lives is to be the best daughter or the best son you can be. Or the best student. Or the best athlete or the best musician. Whatever it might be. Whatever the Lord has called you to do and to be, we are called to do it and be it to the best of our abilities, right? So when the Lord calls you to do something and you know it's from the Lord, now, people always say, how do you know that? Well, all I can tell you is my experience. From the age of 18 to the age of 40, the feeling did not go away. I tried my best, man, I did everything. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was the president of the United Methodist Women. You know, I was a lay leader of the church for Pete's sake. I was the district lay leader. I was on the conference lay leadership board. I was doing, 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 hoping that that would be enough. Have you ever, have you ever done that? You know what the Lord has called you to and you're thinking, well, maybe this will, this will do it. This will be enough. And it was always, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. But there's more that I have called you to. So that, that feeling, that understanding would not go away. You couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it over and over. I mean, I wasn't just talking about it all the time, but it was there. And you're very uncomfortable when you try to do something else. If, if you're truly being called to something specific, that voice in your head just keeps saying, this is the way and I need you to follow it. So, we're called to not detour around it or take the easy way. We listen, we pray. And we listen some more, we pray some more. And I didn't put up there, but you seek wise counsel. You know, I talk to a whole lot of people. And when they would say, yeah, Cindy, you know, there's just something. That is probably what you should be doing. Then, you know, that was just a reinforcement of what I knew the Lord had called me to do. Each of our callings is important. Each of them is important. I'm only telling you about my story. Each of your callings is important. And whether, whether, and many of us end up doing a job that we're just doing that job because we need to pay the bills, right? And God will bless you in that too. But if there's some other way of accomplishing that call on your life, even while you're paying the bills, then I think God would call you to that too, right? Those avocation things that we do that are what the Lord is calling us to do. Then, after we've listened and prayed and listened and prayed a lot, then we are called to take that next step of faith and follow that path. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it just seems real clear. Other times it's difficult. Oh, Jesus' path was not easy. Other times it's difficult there may be some detours along the way, but we keep striving to do what God has called us to do. Jesus knew where his path would lead. He knew it. And he followed it anyway. He followed it anyway. He did not try to go around it or just stay away from it. He headed straight to it. And millions upon millions upon millions of people are thankful that he did. 
Let's pray. Oh Lord, help us to follow the way you have for each of us. And help us not to detour off of your path. In the name of Jesus, amen.